Welcome to ETSU Department of Psychiatry's Grand Rounds. Dr. John Hendrick is our lecturer today. He is an associate professor of psychiatry at ETSU. He's currently the chief of psychiatry at Mountain Home VA Medical Center as well, which is the second largest psychiatric group practice in Tennessee. Dr. Hendrick is also a distinguished fellow of the APA and past president of the Tennessee Psychiatric Association. He's twice been named the outstanding teacher in the ETSU Psychiatry Residency Program and has received an Irma J. Bland Award for Excellence in Psychiatric Research ed Residency Education from the APA. Currently, he is the track director for neurosciences in the ETSU Department of Psychiatry and VA ETSU Liaison Coordinator for Psychiatric Education. He's also a member of the ETSU Annual Pain Treatment Seminar Committee. Dr. Hendrick has expertise in brain behavior and the interaction of psychopharmacological agents with specific neural circuitry. Dr. Hendrick. Thank you, Josh. Life is short, art long, opportunity fleeting, experience treacherous, judgment difficult. This was said by somebody near and dear to us all, Hippocrates, and I am a big fan I have no disclosures other than my VA and ETSU connections. Uh, this is Hippocrates, and I was very impressed by these comments on his statue in my medical school. Now, ever since Hippocrates' day, the issue of dealing with these common phenomenon has been a difficulty for doctors. Pain comes with the side on the medical surgical list and anxiety is very frequently seen in the practice of psychiatry. The interface of these two things is unavoidable because those that experience chronic pain and those that have problems with chronic management of medical illness often find themselves anxious and with a long enough period of time in that anxiety find that depression can soon follow. So psychiatry frequently involved with common anxiety disorders pain disorders, the two integrating in a way that causes real trouble. Well, what is that real trouble? Very frequently, of course, it's this, the issue of addiction. Well, how do we look at addictions? How do we consider them? There are a couple of ways. You can look at the medical model, in which case you're looking at the nature of habituation and tolerance, but most significantly, you're looking at the question of tachyphylaxis. Now, this is an opiates-related phenomenon, generally. And what happens is that once started on opiates, it'll only go so long before a requisite need to increase the opiate dosing to get the same effect will occur. Now, this medical model doesn't look quite as comprehensively at the nature of addictions as the AA model. And as a result, the issue of harm reduction becomes the logical philosophical outgrowth. And this argumentation between harm reduction and abstinence often gets into this decision set, this difficult judgment set, in both the issues of addictions to either opiates or uh, benzodiazepines. In the AA model, basically the addiction is seen as any dependence on a psychoactive substance for stabilization of essentially anything. So this is a more comprehensive model in some ways to look at addiction. So having said a little about what it is, let's look at what it isn't. Just because someone is physically dependent on an opiate does not in and of itself constitute an addiction. But below, at the bottom, if you notice, becomes a problem if. And this is where we get into many of our difficulties. If opioids are not tapered when pain resolves, or if benzodiazepines are used chronically when the indications are quite improper. Now, these are issues that have become very difficult. Um, the first is much of what the Opiate Safety Initiative is focused on over at the VA, what the concern about opiate dependence in Appalachia in general is about. And soon, we will be focusing in the VA, too, about the issue of benzodiazepines use. We already are in mental health quite a bit but it's going to increase as we get a little further along with stabilization of the opioid safety initiative over there. So if opioids are inappropriately withheld for some reason, like a classic example would be somebody had upped their dose 
they should be taking four a day, they're taking 12 a day, and now they're withheld because, guess what? They're out and nobody will prescribe them. Or, if there's aberrant use of benzodiazepines especially, we can get into problems with this physical dependence. Another thing that addiction isn't necessarily is tolerance. Now, opioids will cause tolerance, and they will in a much briefer period than benzodiazepines. So there then becomes a need to increase dose to get the same effect, but one of the characteristics and something that most clinicians find in practice is if you have somebody with an anxiety disorder, once you find their dosage of benzodiazepine, that is their dosage. And as a matter of fact, you'll notice from my bottom point on this slide, uh, dose escalation for people that are stabilized actually becomes something the anxiety disorder patient resists. Now the other points that I make on this slide are that dose stabilization for those with addiction problems are very, very different. For instance, if I say to someone, um, gosh, you've had this tragedy in your life, maybe I should give you 10 milligrams of Ambien at bedtime for the next two weeks, the addict is going to say, could you make that 20 milligrams and could we go for a four-week plan? Whereas the stabilized anxiety disorder patient is much more likely to say, oh, please don't. My dose is satisfactory and if you do this, I'm not sure exactly what it will mean to me. So that increased internal sensitivity in anxiety disorder patients makes a world of difference. And in understanding this, we need to think about the complexity of defining addiction. It has a psychosocial component, and that psychosocial component requires quite a bit of judgment and wisdom in judgment. So as many of you, all of you that know me, were likely to believe I'm going to say something about the behavioral neurology of this, and I'm going to start by talking about a classic behavioral neurology phenomenon. An attorney is examining a pathologist, and he says, so doctor, uh, how did you know that the patient was dead? And the pathologist said, because I'm a pathologist and I know dead. That's what I do. And the attorney says, yes, but when I go to my doctor, he always does something to check on me, and I wonder if you did that for this patient. I says, what the heck are you talking about? And the attorney says, well, I believe he calls it vital signs. He takes vital signs. Did you take this patient's vital signs? And the pathologist said, no, I didn't take his vital signs. He was dead. Well, that didn't quite click for the attorney. So the attorney said to him, in a classic example of why attorneys should never ask questions they don't know the answer to, um, how did you know that he was dead? And the answer to that question was, and so, okay, the pathologist, though, wasn't quite done with the attorney. He thought about it, and he commented this, followed by a short pause in which he finalized the statement by saying this. Well, now, what does this have to do with addictions? The problem is good judgment and wisdom and choice has everything to do with understanding the diagnosis of addiction and understanding what addictions are, aren't, and what you should be doing about them. We have been into a very difficult period of time. Now, some of you in this room, those of you unfortunate enough to have practiced medicine as long as I, may remember that there was an era of paternalism in which doctors' choices were the focus of doctors' care delivery. And this has largely been supplanted by a doctrine of informed consent, which has had some interesting phenomenon. Like, for instance, in the era of doctor's paternalism, placebo rates were typically 3 to 7 percent in studies. And these days, placebo rates are 30 to 35 percent. Are those two things related? Many think they are. So the instantiation of medical malpractice suits empowered many things. And one of the unfortunate things it empowered was the flat-out acceptance of, subje of subjective reporting of what's going on. Are you anxious? Yes, I am. Are you in pain? Yes, I am. Should we just believe that? Well, it's interesting because at the same time in the other list down here, managed care comes in at about the same time and endorses checklist medicine for all practical purposes. 
And if you don't practice it, reimbursements become very difficult and medical legal circumstances can become difficult. And in the coordination of these two phenomena, a third thing occurs. JCH makes a critical but disturbing decision. They make a decision that pain control or seeing to pain control is a fifth vital sign. Well, that's not a fifth vital sign. So we're coming back to my issue of vital signs in general. Vital signs are things that are objectively measured. And vital signs are things that are predictable in various pathological states. It's not do you have pain that represents a question about a fifth vital sign. The only way that this sign becomes objective is if you say, do you have any pain? And the patient's subjective report to you is, no, doctor, I do not. Well, you can take that to the bank. Because if a patient does have pain, they're very likely to report it to a doctor, almost certainly going to, not going to hide it. Some might, but very few. And on the other hand, as soon as someone says, yes, doctor, I do have pain, it's not an indication that their pain control is insufficient, particularly in terms of prescribing opioids. It's a question of, what does it mean? So with vital signs, okay, there's this issue of objectivity versus subjectivity. If you say, are you having pain, and they say no, you can deal with it. But otherwise, if they say yes, you get into a myriad of factors that require wisdom and judgment. And psychiatry has always known this because Freud helped us to understand in consciousness we experience our consciousness as if we have free will. OK, that's good. But in behavioral neurology, I'm going to tell you what we have is free won't. Some of you have heard me say that before. And why is that? Because the unconscious drives of both thought and action are extremely powerful in our mental states. They lead to an apparent causal path that is bridged by the subjective experience internally we all have of, of conscious will. But in fact, there are many factors going into any behavioral decision we make, whether it's to take or to not take drugs, or any of those things. And unfortunately, when JCH decided to obscure the issue by not saying the absence of pain is the fifth vital sign, they overlooked an entire field of psychiatry that psychiatrists do not overlook, the nature of somatic phenomenon. So these are symptoms and preoccupations, exaggerations. They're egodystonic to the individual. They feel bad. And so we can't always control something like this by throwing medications at it. We often have to understand what it means. So this particular misunderstanding that we should have been asking about the absence of pain and defining what pain means if that's disavowed uh, has had a tremendously reverberating consequence. Now, this is a timeline, and I don't know that you necessarily need to read it all, but between malpractice and the institution of checklist medicine and managed care, changing, for instance, the um, visual analog scale into the standard, instead of asking for the physician's judgment about the circumstance, gets to the place where physicians are now empowered to quiet problems. Well, we've got 15 minutes, maybe 30. And how do we quiet those problems? Well, if you throw opiates and benzodiazepines at it, it quiets a lot of things, but probably not the underlying problem. So anyway, as circumstances continue, more and more opiate problems develop. And amongst psychiatry, we are tasked to look at each individual patient and consider, do they have integrated brain functions? Well, if they're addicted to a controlled substance, that's probably a questionable issue. And the issue of the coherence of their mind is probably distinctively impaired if, in fact, they don't have integrated brain function. And for psychiatry, there is the challenge of bringing empathy to the situation. So whether someone is addicted, or whether someone is mentally impaired, or whether someone is physically and psychologically complex, we're still required to bring empathy to our patients. 
So what is it? We need to be able to identify what's really wrong. Not what's wrong on the visual analog scale, not what's wrong on the checklist, but what's going on with the patient consciously and unconsciously. Are they involved in an emotional contagion? For instance, are they heavily involved in a drug culture where the answer to everything is take another pill? Can you feel along with them? Which is not an easy thing to do when somebody is difficult emotionally, impaired cognitively, and maybe not exactly somebody that you think highly of. Can you put that into perspective? Can you understand cognition the way they understand it? Can you truly feel along with them? Well, to do this requires function of brain. What kind of function? Now, yesterday, the medical students who are here today, I told them they'd have to go through this twice, so my apologies to them. The brain function that's interesting here in many ways is the issue of the insular lobe. And you see the temporal lobe cut away to expose the insular lobe here, and why? This particular lobe of the brain is involved in idiomotor translation of functions from the brain. So the frontal lobe is pushing information in here, and this is translating into visceral and motoric reactions of the gut. Well, why does that make a difference? In terms of who wants what, people want things. They want relief from pain. They want relief from anxiety. They want to know how to go about doing this. Well, the brain is structured in this way. And one of the things that happens in idiovisceral motor performance is sapience is added to the nature of pain perception. Sapience is a neurological phenomenon that the brain is very effective at. Executive functions are integrated with limbic functions. Various integrative functions, especially at diencephalic and cortical levels, occur. And these lead to motor programs, sensory perceptual changes. Well, these things can often be extremely negative for the addicted person or the person who's struggling with anxiety disorder that's undertreated or poorly treated. And so, psychiatry also knows in these complex situations we bring defense mechanisms into play. And the purpose of these is to protect the mind, or the self, the ego, from anxiety, or from other problems, from these things that I'm referring to as ego dystonia. So some people bring extremely pathological, low-grade defense mechanisms. Others are immature, but better able to cope, and not as apparently crazy, if you will, at least in their appearance to others around them, and then many of us find ourselves functioning with our neurotic defense mechanisms, and that's kind of the way that life is for many people. But some of us, recognizing that there's more to it than that, begin to find our way into mature defenses. Now, I have this kind of complex comment here that says require limited influence by historical negative enablers. What I'm meaning by that is if you grow up in an environment where you never have any modeling of high-level mature defense mechanisms, it's not easy to find your way into this category of behavioral response. So if you have very difficult negative associations in growing up, uh, then it can be very hard to transcend some of these unconscious drives. But people are able to do it, and for physicians, the question of how to uh, employ these levels of uh, intervention wisely can be looked at also, again, with some behavioral neurological, neurological considerations. So, we encourage our patients to take prosocial attitudes. We try and help them to increase their pragmatic knowledge of life. We try and find emotional homeostasis, better self-understanding. We try and put values in perspective. And we deal with uncertainty. All of these things are components of what we're expected to do. Now, these things are very much hardwired in the brain. And in the first two, we see the top-down influence pressing executive functions into decision-making. 
In the next two, we see valuation judgments being employed. The anterior cingulate cortex has much to do with driving motivation into the prefrontal areas of the brain. And then we see subcortical structures such as the striatum and amygdala working in such a way to deal with the world both emotionally and in regards to fear and threat, all of which are very much a component of both anxiety and pain and addiction in that if anybody threatens to take the addictive substance away, remember that tolerance and physical dependence thing? That's when problems start. If someone threatens the same for stabilized anxiety, problems can start. Or if you're undertreated or underdiagnosed or improperly diagnosed in any of these areas, fear and threat become involved. And then the ventral striatum is very involved in the reward pathway, and I'll come back to that. But I wanted to name it here. So top-down influence from the prefrontal cortex is very important in this regard. It's involved in our emotional regulation and decision-making and helping to judge values. The lateral prefrontal area is more involved in rational values. The medial prefrontal area more involved in emotional values. And as we will see, these things come together to make judgments in the context of wisdom. There are also neurobiological correlates of pro-social attitudes. Okay? The reward circuitry is very much involved. People that attain wisdom realize that often the common good must be taken into account to understand what that means. And people that are fortunate enough to learn how to use altruism effectively in their life find they receive more good from the altruism than the amount it costs them to put out there. People who have found wisdom are typically warm, and they're very positive. These are good people to surround yourself with. So in social decision making, we have to have a good factual knowledge of life. We have to know how to proceed to deal with life's problems, because we all find them coming to us. We know how, when, where to apply these things. And we need to use good judgment. So emotional homeostasis is a very important thing. One usually can achieve this best if they've developed a fair sense of self-understanding. Everybody needs to find a way into emotional stability despite the fact that your life is going to be filled with uncertainties, with dilemmas. You have to learn how to manage those things. It's a good idea often, especially when you don't think you've done this well, to reflect back on what it means and reflect back on how your judgments could have shifted? Can you transcend some of these difficulties? Why do we do all these things? Because, guess what? Our neurotransmitters come into play. Some of our neurotransmitters are very involved with pro-social attitudes. Um, oxytocin in particular these days is being referred to frequently as the affiliative hormone. But another piece of this also is impulse control. Now, if we think about those that are truly struggling with addictions, especially opiate addictions, but in some cases benzodiazepine addiction, um, they also have substantial dysregulation in, emo in emotional homeostasis, and this is frequently affiliated with impulse control. This gets into this issue of the deterioration of social dysfunction. And so, these things have a biochemical basis, but they also have an impact in behavior and they uh, can be very negatively experienced by those with addictive illness. So how do we deal with uncertainty? And the answer is we begin to put value relativism in place. I suspect all of you have met people who have certain values that they absolutely will not cross. Well, that's not necessarily a wrong thing. But it is a difficult thing for adjustment to certain circumstances. It depends how inflexible the social circumstance is, because the two can butt up against one another very easily. So cognitive wisdom often requires an awareness of life's uncertainties and the ability to make decisions in spite of the fact that we can never really know what might happen next. Another very important point, you'll see at the bottom of the slide here, is the absence of projections. 
Are you owning this material psychologically for yourself? Or are you projecting it on the others around you? If so, it's an interesting and complicated question to think about what that may mean in regards to my empathy slide and that idea theory of mind. How does your behavior impact others and their behavior impact you emotionally? Well, it does it for one thing in a wide range of neurotransmitter activities. These are just 22 neurotransmitter activities that get involved in these complex emotional, mental integrations. But in spite of all of these, and I'm sure this is a very limited list, it's probably, you know, a fifth of what's actually going on maybe, I, I don't know, but it's a very limited list. I'm sure it'll prove to be some years from now, not enough. But one thing that isn't going to change is still when we look at things like sapience, putting secondary value on things, okay, the few in particular, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, are going to remain in charge of much of the neuromodulation of our lives. And in this regard, they're going to get involved with some other very important ones, like for instance, endorphins, critical in understanding opiate addiction because the brain will ward circuit, including the nucleus accumbens, including the thalamus, and including the periaqueductal gray, the location of most endorphins and enkephalins. This particular reward circuit, this circuit is probably neurologically much more influential in human behavior than the PAPES circuit ever was. The PAPES circuit is an interesting idea about emotional control and regulation, but it doesn't really play out against the knowledge that we have now. It has some findings of interest, but it doesn't really work. This one, on the other hand, does work. And why? Because this is a neuromodulatory and emotionally involved system that very much helps in the control and modulation, regulation of opiate receptors, which tend to be in the periaqueductal region. And you see them here. A little bit more about the brain and how it works. The anterior cingulate, the cortical portion of the limbic system, is very involved in conflict detection and then formulates emotional drives that it projects into the frontal cortex, often thought to be now source of what Freud would have called id motive. And the posterior cingulate has another interesting phenomenon. For one thing, there is an information pathway from the frontal eye fields to the occipital lobe there. But look at some of the things that surround that visual processing information. Moral sensitivity and the processing of self-relevant stimuli. Those are unusual things to have unless you have an integrated brain that needs to put these things together to form a coherent mind. So the lateral prefrontal cortex is very involved in effortful reasoning, in uh, processing things like ambiguity using rational process. Once we move to the medial and ventromedial areas, we get much more into valuation judgments. Okay? Or I said that wrong, value judgments, um, charged with deciding about affectively laden things deciding about what is your own personal morality. All of these issues get into how physicians deal with pain, anxiety, and addiction, and they get into how people with addiction problems or poorly controlled pain or anxiety make judgments. And then the orbitofrontal cortex combines both the rational value, the emotional value, into a valuation set, okay, a coding, encoding affective value of stimulus and reward, and trying to place some ego, some superego function controls in play, which can be difficult for both physicians and patients. So this little system is complicated, but we've talked about most of the pieces of it right now, and these are the areas implicated in reward. Now, reward mechanisms are manipulated by opiate addicts, no question about it. They're also often overwhelmed by those manipulations. They should be functional without exogenous circumstance, without exo 
exogenous chemicals to people individually. So a goal would be to have our patients experience an absence of pain, and for that matter, an absence of anxiety. And if the reward system is operationally defined effectively, that should be the case. Now, the amygdala is always monitoring this. Are things safe? Is the environment threatening? Should I be in fear? They're the little brains of the big brain. They function bicamerally. They function together. But they bring a tremendous amount of influence on emotional decision making. And in some ways, what the left one wants to do is win the battle for today, whereas the right one wants to not lose, enabled, to be enabled to fight again tomorrow. Well, those problems come into conflict, and no more so than in the area of substance-related and addictive disorders. So substance use disorders are ubiquitous. This is uh, 10, 11 if you count other. And then the implications of the complications of what happens with substance-induced disorders are also listed. So these are very negative difficulties for those that have addiction problems. And simultaneously, those with anxiety disorders have an equally complicated list. They can be overwhelmed by this symptomatology. Okay. So we've come to a place where we've talked about the nature of addiction. We've talked about the behavioral neurology of how these things get into either the promotion of wisdom or the deterioration of wisdom. And we've gotten to the place where we're starting to think now about the common pathway of the fact that those with poor pain control or those with underdiagnosed or undertreated anxiety may have a lot of dysphoria. So, can we throw them all into a category? Can we say some are addicted and some aren't and that's it? And that's going to be our wisdom and judgment? No, because it gets more complicated than that. In medicine, there's always another list. And here's a complex list. There's a real huge difference here. Okay? For instance, acute pain in the undiagnosed or currently unimpaired. Somebody twisted their ankle and it hurts a lot. And we give them four doses of five milligram Lortab, and a couple of days later, their ankle doesn't hurt so much. Okay, and they use a little support or something like that. Well, you know, that's not a big problem. It's a common ED phenomenon. But then there is a spectrum all the way down to the place where we get into the special vulnerability of somebody who has very long and complex history of poorly controlled substance abuse now has either an acute or a chronic pain phenomenon that has a very substantial underlying physiologic definable circumstance. And what the heck do we do with them? Because that is a tough situation. Okay, just because you had a long history of alcoholism all through your 20s and 30s and a 10 year period of sobriety in your 40s doesn't mean that you might not fall victim to osteoarthritis or peripheral neuropathy with serious impairment in your 50s or 60s. Also, the degree of psychiatric impairment comes into play here. And one of the things that I want to argue about is the fact that, or that I want to set out as an argument, is the fact that medical doctors dealing with that list I showed at the beginning of pain, common pain syndromes, often are very uncomfortable dealing with the anxiety and depression that are associated with it. And psychiatrists are often very uncomfortable making definitive judgments about these pain syndrome phenomena. So the degree of psychiatric and medical impairment have to be considered. Consultation is often very necessary. And we have to decide frequently mutually what to do about these things. So whether we're talking about acute pain or chronic pain, looking at the different categories of individuals and what they bring to the table. For instance, chronic pain in the resilient. These are often people that have mastered very high levels of defense mechanisms. And that mature defense mechanism set, they're quite capacitated for. That group of individuals may very well want very much to look at any alternative to control their chronic pain phenomenon outside of medications. Not particularly unusual. 
So we have to think about the differential diagnosis. And to do this, we have to consider aberrant behaviors. What are the functional parameters of addiction? What does pseudo-addiction look like? Do we have problems with chronic encephalopathies or anxiety, depression, personality disorder? And one that physicians often get uncomfortable being asked to judge is their criminal intent. Sometimes there is in these phenomenon, and it's important to judge. Mm, so I just, oh, there we go. Thank you, Brian. He told me I was going to mute slide at least once there. So what we have to do is then look at the risk of addiction and consider what it is in regards to aberrant behaviors. Now, I'll come to this list of aberrant behaviors. Um, but if you think that long-term exposure puts your patient at high risk, that's probably a very important thing to take into account. Some factors that are important, OK? So think about this. Prescription forgery and selling drugs, um, injecting, even oral formulations. These are very predictive of likely addiction phenomenon. The fact that someone drug hoards, does that predict addiction? Maybe, but a lot less so because very frequently these people are so fearful that they will come into a period of time when they don't have access to medicine, and if they have a small hoard available, they know they'll be able to get through, at least for some period of time. If they escalate their dose, well, if they escalate their dose and you tell them not to and they say, yeah, I guess I shouldn't have. I won't do it again, doctor. Like Steve Lloyd used to say, he didn't worry about the impaired physician necessarily that got a first DUI. He worried a lot about the physician who got a second DUI. So the question is, do you have a pattern of behaviors that are deteriorating social function? Or did you make an error in judgment? The two are different. So pseudo-addiction can be a problem because people will watch the clock very closely. They want to avoid cravings. They will sometimes get into aberrant behavior, such as unsanctioned dose escalations. But if they get back to their standard analgesia and they haven't developed a tolerance, they'll probably come through this. Opiate use. What are opiate addicts chasing? Seems like. The superficial answer is relief of pain, but I would disagree. I don't think that's actually it. That's a secondary thing. There's an old term from opiate palaces called chasing the dragon. What opiate addicts are doing, they're chasing the dragon. They're looking to dissociate. They recognize that their aberrant use of opiates isn't resolving their pain. Their pain's over here. But if they are dissociated enough, and they are psychologically over here, it is the dissociation from the pain that is actually the thing that they're finding. They understand that they're addicted. It's not a surprise to them if you tell them. They know it already. But they don't want to give up this dissociation. It is a valuable defense mechanism employed in limited amounts, but employed in drug addictions, not valuable. Why is it important? Because this is what happens. Nociceptive, or for that matter, anxiety input comes in, and it gets into the autonomic and somatomotor systems that we talked about earlier. These perceived threats evolve from those subcortical regions of the brain. And all of that sets off a secondary impact of memory and secondary appraisal and cognitive reconsideration of what this means, leading then to secondary pain effects. Like, for instance, chasing the dragon, trying to find dissociation from these dysphoric states, whether they're pain or anxiety or anything ego dystonic. This leads to the idea that pain and suffering are not the same. So we, in fact, want to do all we can to eliminate suffering of our patients. That's an important thing to do. For one thing, if somebody has chronic pain, 
and you can eliminate their suffering reasonably, it gives you a much stronger alliance and capacity to deal with the things that are causing the pain itself. But understanding that there is a difference in these two things is very important. And one of the reasons is it brings us back to the paternalism of doctors practicing medicine because doctors understand there is clear nociceptive pain when tissue injury has caused it. There is neuropathic pain which is much less clear. It appears to have to do with abnormal processing, probably largely at the central nervous system level, but to a certain extent at the peripheral level as well. And then there is psychogenic pain, in which pain probably is occurring and is sustained by psychological factors leading to this area of somatization. And then there's the old saying about idiopathic pain, where you say to your patient, I don't know why you have pain. That's, of course, well-defined in medicine. Idiopathic pain means that clearly the doctor is an idiot and the patient is pathetic. And it's an unfortunate truism that there are idiopathic pains, but the reason I make the joke that I make about doctors and patients in this regard is idiopathic pain is not always something to just write off. Sometimes idiopathic pain comes to physicians' attention, and five years later, disease status has progressed to the place where now we understand what's going on. So it is important to understand that even though I've said the absence of pain would be the fifth vital sign, when somebody does endorse it, it could be that it's an early premonitory sign. And so therefore, we are required to do cautious, and investigative pain assessments. What provokes this pain? What is palliative? What's its quality? Where is it? How bad? When? Now, all of these things can be highly variable. Think about the difference between a chronic pain such as um, chronic regional pain disorder versus an episodic pain like migraine. Okay? They're very serious. But they're very, very different, and we need to look at the PQRST of them. We need to take a careful history, and we need to do something else. If we're going to take on these patients, you probably want to do a few things to cover yourself as a physician. First, don't prescribe when you first see them. As a matter of fact, I think a good rule of thumb is don't prescribe until you see them for the third time. Convince yourself that your diagnosis is what it is, that you don't doubt it, that you know where you're going. And we have found, certainly from the Opiate Safety uh, Initiative at the VA and from experiences in the VA, writing policy for both chronic opiate users and chronic benzodiazepine users can be a very good idea. Have a written policy. If you get visited by the Board of Medicine or the Board of Pharmacy, you'll be glad you had a written policy. And in that policy, leave yourself plenty of options. Okay, Because you may want to go a wide variety of ways. You may want to refer for medical surgical intervention. You may want to do yourself or refer for psychotherapies. And these things can be very important. You don't want to agree to necessarily give chronic benzodiazepines or opiates to patients. You want to make a careful assessment. You want to understand that in pain disorders and in anxiety disorders, undertreatment is common because many physicians are concerned about prescribing. So you only do it chronically if you're sure it's the right thing to do. And you can vet it with anybody who looks over your shoulder and asks. And one of the ways you do that is you document about this. You don't give more opiates than is necessary for proper analgesia. You consider and document what the psychosocial functioning of the patient is in terms of activities of daily life. Are you improving the situation or merely sedating your patient? What are the adverse side effects, those beyond uh, sedation? And what about aberrant behaviors? Is this someone who's selling half of their monthly prescription? That kind of question. So we have a large range of pharmacotherapies, but all of them carry the warning of caution 
in combination with other sedatives. So one thing that I would say, and that we have clearly determined at VA at this level, is this combination plan of benzodiazepines and opiates is not something we're initiating at all again. And we are very strongly looking at bringing down first those that are on both. We don't think it's a good idea. Benzodiazepines do tend to be disinhibiting, and opiate disinhibition is not pretty to see. We also have to worry about the dosing strategies here on these opioids because while constipation is very common, and I've already mentioned sedativeness, also paralytic ileus can become a surgical emergency. So looking at this pharmacotherapy, yes, we can use, we can use mu agonists, but also we should not ignore the use of adjunctive and supplemental agents as seen in the right-hand group. So what should we be doing? Recognize that for any individual, there isn't a correct dose. You have to decide how impaired are they and by what rationale. Okay? Remember that? Rational valuation. Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, rational valuation. Make judgments about the dose increments. Opioids have no real ceiling, therefore there can be no maximal dose. However, that doesn't mean there can't be an overdose followed by a death. Certainly can be. We have to learn to assess these complicated patients, realizing that they often cross the boundary between psychiatry and medical care. Always use effective prescribing principles that you can explain to anyone who looks at them. Treatment contracts, very helpful. Okay. And anybody doing a lot of this probably should have a lot of experience or boarding in substance abuses or addiction medicine. What do you do? Chronic pain patients similar to those with anxiety disorders that are undertreated seek relief. Addicts seek drugs. Oh, doctor, couldn't you make that 5 milligrams of Lortab a 10 milligram? Couldn't, couldn't you make that prescription for 120 instead of 100? You're in control of these decisions, and the board will not let you be anything but in control of these decisions. So the forbearance of wisdom and judgment in these choices is on each physician. One thing you can also do is add adjunctive agents. They often help markedly. However, you've got to be very careful with this because they are typically off-label. So again, documentation of informed consent can be very important. So some things that should be done. Look for affective disorders and treat them to remission whenever possible. Try not to get into irrational polypharmacy. Remember, mirtazapine can be helpful as a sedative. Um, and it can be a much more effective mood elevator than trazodone, though I think trazodone has gained some ground lately. I begrudgingly let this be the case in my comments. You can do other things. You can take on more complicated, rational polypharmacy. I've seen situations on multiple occasions where my colleagues in pain management really didn't even notice the psychotic decompensation of a patient. I typically will trade some benzodiazepines for opiates, though when I do so, I put a time limit on how long that decision is for. Use your common sense and never be willing to say no or just no. You can say that. You do have that empowerment. You should be generally supportive. It's important to use compassion. It's important in order to be wise in your judgment about these things to, for instance, get collateral information. Okay? I often insist on stepwise plans. Oh, doctor, that Tylenol will never help my pain. How do I know that? Well, I took two once and it didn't help me. Not enough. I want a stepwise plan for how much Tylenol use and for how long. And I want to know what it means. Because maybe it'll work. Good science, good medicine, okay? Use consultants. Think about physical mechanical interventions. Will they help you? Use standard medical care. 
if you're using your usual routines and you can explain those usual routines to anybody looking over your shoulder, it helps you. Okay? And then finally, you can always terminate if you must. It's not easy to terminate. You have to be careful. You can be accused of patient abandonment, but you can do it. However, I would much prefer you terminate care than you get into boundary crossings. The value of your services is your fee. That's it. Don't expect more. Don't be doggedly stubborn. If it's outside of your area of expertise, do you need to be practicing there? Do you need to do it on your own, or should you get collegial consultation? Okay. Obviously, you don't practice pain management in patients and where you have a dual role. Oh, well, my cousin needs some Valium, so I just decided I'd give it to him. I don't think that's going to turn out too well. Okay? And don't accept valuable gifts or reimbursements other than your fees. So some psychopharmacology don'ts. Okay? Mainly, think through what you're doing. Look these things up. Look at interactions. Usually, you don't want to use more than one drug in a category. You try not to use off-label, but sometimes you must, so just get an informed consent. Look for side effects. And remember, Buspar really doesn't treat phobic anxiety, but the caveat to that is not everybody with phobic anxiety only has phobic anxiety. They may have double anxiety with a generalized component as well. So I'm not saying that Buspar doesn't have a role. I'm saying it needs to have a properly organized diagnostic role. Be careful with the interactions of opiates and psychotropics. Orthostatic hypotension with second generation drugs is becoming an increasing concern. We see it in hospitalized patients very frequently. And if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. So especially when you're mixing in these complicated combinations, document it all the time. If you have a poorly responsive patient, look at side effects. Consider the idea that your colleague pain manager might want to look at the spinal root of administration. It can give you a lot of information about how strong the analgesia needs to be. Critically review the adjuvant group. Consider rotating an opioid, even if you're not prescribing it. Suggest it to the opioid prescriber in your, in your group of docs that are involved. And don't forget, these things haunt all of us in the background. We shouldn't be empowering diversion in the community. We've got a big enough problem without our contributing to it. We have to be careful about confidentiality. This is a special group for confidentiality. Uh, we've talk, I've talked at length, I think, about informed consent. But remember, that requires both capacity and competency. Pain and addiction in general are frequent areas of litigation between patients and especially psychiatrists and other doctors. And then the secondary gain of disability compensation can come into this as a very substantial factor as well. So you have to decide exactly how far you're going to go with that and keep it within your expertise. So, chronic pain and inadequately treated anxiety disorders continue to affect many people's quality of life. We have to assess rigorously what these are, treat them effectively and not necessarily for long term. Pulse opiate dosing is probably where pain is going. Chronic opiate dosing is probably not where it's going. And more and more, we are looking for alternatives to chronic benzodiazepine managements. Cultural factors are important. We see that locally and in West Virginia. We need to effectively address mental health needs in these unfortunate patients. And all of this is very difficult because we have to be cautious about aberrant behaviors. Now I'm going to stop here and take questions. Some of you may recognize that this is Wilhelm Reich. And I may talk about Wilhelm, but I'll uh, choose to use my remaining few minutes for questions first and then only talk about Wilhelm in a moment. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to try.
Um, <laughs> no, Shambhavi's never speechless. <laughs> well, I sometimes am. Um, I don't, there was a lot of material. Clearly, yes. you covered a whole lot in a very efficient time. But I was looking at it, and did I maybe miss seeing acupuncture listed anywhere there? No, I missed it. It's okay, a very I, good point. Thank okay, you. Okay, I just kind of I, I just to realized raise that. I, I did not. I also don't think I included chiropractic. Right. I may have, but I don't remember it now that I think back. Right. That's a very good point. Okay. And, you know, and, and the other component is that it's interesting, you know, because sometimes you'll get patients that come in and talk about how they'd want you to recommend that they get massages for chronic uh -huh. back pain. But with recent information suggesting that maybe that doesn't really do such a great job, uh, per se kind of supports that maybe we don't jump into that person. You know, regarding your acupuncture point, we are looking very seriously at using uh, battlefield acupuncture as part of our chronic pain strategy at the VA. We're not there yet, but we're certainly trying to get there. We have two practitioners that are quite capacitated. And battlefield acupuncture for acute wounds are certainly being used in the Department of Defense. Uh, John, that was a great presentation with uh, a huge uh, coverage of uh, integration of uh, the issues at different levels. Uh, but uh, one thing that uh, I wanted to ask you was, uh, will your uh, next presentation be depression, pain, and addiction? And, you know, for me, depression has really been intimately involved with uh, treating chronic pain patients. Uh, not to take anything away from anxiety. I also wanted to uh, ask you about the importance of types of pain, like neuropathic pain. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a last point, uh, the potential involvement of the reticular activating system. So Dr. Lichtman pointed out when I told him the title that this should be easy to stick into one hour. Uh, and I appreciated his comment because it's, it's true. This is a huge subject. I took it on very specifically because there is so much emphasis on opiates and benzodiazepines in VA at this point in time. And I had to limit it at some level, hence only a few references to the affective disorders. Uh, I think your point about the reticular activating system is very interesting. It's closely affiliated in the aqueductal region, closely affiliated with endorphins, closely affiliated with the activation of the brain reward system. So unfortunately, trying to integrate as much behavioral neurology as I did with as much psychiatry as I did, um, not something that I got to. But I agree with you, that's an important feature. And uh, I have no idea what my next grand round is going to be. Please. Uh, just a simple one, really. Uh, lesions of the dorsal raphae abolish morphine analgesia in rats. I, and I'm sorry, abolish? Abolish morphine analgesia. Really? Lesions, yeah, which sort of cycles back to your point. Right, very directly because of projections from the periaqueductal grade to the raphae nuclei. And uh, uh, when you have uh, those uh, projections uh, following down, you have descending uh, uh, neurons that are serotonin releasing neurons that uh, inhibit encephalonergic, or sorry, uh, stimulate encephalonergic interneurons at the level of the dorsal root. So there's an entire path that you can go through from the periaqueductal gray on uh, through to the dorsal root and sensory uh, afferents. Well, the one other comment that I'm going to make is, I assume we know this in rats and aren't as sure about it in humans, simpler brains. Nonetheless, I don't doubt that it has very substantial impact, impact in human brain. I don't doubt that for a second. But I, I assume we don't know it as clearly, or do you, in human brain? Well, the problem is there are just so many more potential diverse pathways that may also impact. Nonetheless, I suspect the point is well taken and well made. I'm going to take just a quick second. The reason I said a couple of things I did, uh, there's a politic of this. And, and actually, 
I took this grand rounds on because I wanted to talk about opiates and benzos and some of the things we're doing in the VA. I know some of my colleagues, Dr. Stos is a colleague of mine in regards to some of this very specifically, are here. And I wanted to do that because I understand the complexity of psychiatry getting into the politic, as did Wilhelm Reich. A neo-Freudian, Reich wrote a book called Listen, Little Man. It was quite the metaphorical commentary. It had to do with the little man and his very fascist way of dealing with the world. And he published it, I believe it was about 1933, and somewhere around about 1936, uh, this fella realized who the little man was. Now that fella's name was Adolf Hitler. And when the little man recognized what the book was about, he decided that it would be a good idea to round up Wilhelm Reich, who having foreknowledge of the fact that this was going to happen, but it took three years, he decided to very quickly get out of Europe. He did, came to America. And in America, he had an interesting phenomenon. He put forward a theory that was not politically very popular at a time when cancer quacks were all over the country. And a guy named John Anslinger, who was the first head of the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, took exception to his theories, which were very consistent with other neo-Freudian ideas, in some ways and in others less. But Anslinger rounded Reich up, something the Nazis weren't able to do, along with many other cancer quacks. He was on vacation in Maine at the time, and they put him in a jail cell for 40 days. And during that period of time, he contracted pneumonia and expired in that jail cell. He was never charged with a crime. He was never given an arraignment hearing. He was just jailed for 40 days. And we managed politically through indiscreet choice and poor impact of judgment and wisdom to kill a man the Nazis missed. So whenever psychiatry gets into these complicated areas that get into the body politic, there is a tremendous risk. And in spite of the fact that that risk exists, as physicians, we have a requirement to be good members of our civic community, aware of what that means, but we also have a requirement, a primary requirement, as Hippocrates said, to treat patients effectively. We need to make proper diagnoses, proper treatment plans. Life is short. Opportunity is fleeting. Thank you.